Daniel chapter 2 this morning. If you want to open your Bibles to that book, Daniel, you can find, if you're not familiar where it is, you can look to the table of contents in your Bible. But Daniel chapter 2. This is a, a lengthy chapter, but it really holds together. It's sort of a single story, and so we're, we're going to try to cover the whole story this morning so we can get the, the feel impact, the, the full impact, the point of it this morning, and I'm going to be reading it in, in sections and then commenting on it this morning. I was remembering in preparation to walk through this passage, I was remembering one of the more difficult moments in my life was right before we moved to plant this church three and a half years ago now. Uh, right before we moved here, there was a, um, a, a small sore on my daughter's wrist, and she'd had it for some period of time, and we'd, we'd noticed it. We thought it was just, you know, something happens to a little kid, they get a little sore, no big deal. And we'd watched it, observed it. It didn't go away, and it seemed to get worse. And so finally, just a couple of weeks before we moved here, we took her to the doctor, and what was, I was assuming, was going to be a routine doctor's visit, doctor's moment, all of a sudden turned into a level of concern that the doctor had, deep concern, so much so that he was wanting to admit her. It was just, we were at an office, and there was a hospital next door, and he said, I think we need to take you there right now. We need to admit her. I'm concerned. This could be something serious. Well, that led to three days in the hospital, unexpected, uh, most of which time was filled with doctors saying, we just don't know what is causing this. We're concerned, could be serious things, and we don't know uh, what the problem is, and they were referencing serious problems. And one of the most difficult things about a moment like that, I know many of you have faced similar moments, is you just don't know what the future holds. It's the not knowing. In some cases, not knowing is harder even than knowing and knowing it's going to be hard. There's in some ways kind of a comfort, almost maybe a cynical comfort. When you know and it's going to be hard, uh, that's difficult. But the not knowing is kind of its own challenge. The not knowing, the speculation, the uncertainty, what, what could happen, what might happen, what might be wrong. We, we don't know. We don't know what could take place. Daniel chapter 2 is designed to comfort Christians who face not knowing. And all of us face this all the time. We face not knowing. We face not knowing about our own spiritual journey. Will I struggle in certain ways? We face not knowing about our family members. We face not knowing about the world and what's going to happen in the world and our country. We face not knowing. There's a troubling aspect to not knowing things. And Daniel chapter 2 is God's word to those that don't know. And it wants to tell them something very, very important. When you're shaken with what you don't know, Daniel 2 is an excellent chapter to read and to enjoy. I'm going to break this story into four sections. We'll read them one at a time, and then I'll comment on each. And if you want those sections, they'll be the dream, the deliverance, the revelation, and the response. The dream, the deliverance, the revelation, and the response. So let's read this first section, which I've titled The Dream, and you'll see why, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But... If you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. 
They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. The dream. If you remember from last week, Nebuchadnezzar is the ruler of the Babylonian Empire. He has conquered the nation of Jerusalem. He has taken captive these four young men princes, as it were, of Judah, and he has brought them into his service. They are in the training track to be among the wise men of the kingdom. We read last week how God delivered them from this track of assimilation that the king had them on and, and honored and gave favor to Daniel. God blessed and watched over Daniel as he tried to stand for his God. And now we have a story from Nebuchadnezzar's reign when he has a dream in the middle of the night. The most powerful emperor in the world has a dream. <laughs> You think of Shakespeare's phrase, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. I mean, it would apply to this situation. Dreams in this time period could be uh, signs or signals. They would have believed them to be signs or signals from the divine about what might happen or a sort of portents of what could take place. And Nebuchadnezzar seems to have some sense that this dream uh, has some meaning, some significance, and he wants to know what it is. And when we find out later what the dream was, uh, it's not surprising. This is a very specific, interesting dream. This isn't some random collection of images. This seems to have some import, some meaning. And somehow Nebuchadnezzar is so concerned about this dream, he's not willing to do what's normal and just tell them what the dream was so that they can apply all of their practices and studies for dream interpretation. That was a normal kind of practice, art, uh, job even on the court, that they have these people, certain signs mean certain things. So if you have this in your dream, this is what's going to happen. If you have this symbol, this is, and they just would look it up in their charts, they would compare and say, here's the interpretation. But he, at some level, has a suspicion <laughs> that that practice is not certain. He says, I, I think this is an important message, but somehow I, I'm in the really down-to-it moment now. I'm, I'm questioning this practice of being able to interpret the dreams. How do I know for sure that your interpretation is is accurate. How do I know for sure that you're not just making up some interpretation? How do I know for sure you're not just guarding your own life by coming up with an interpretation? So he comes up with a foolproof test. I'm going to make you prove, he says, that you have supernatural insight. You tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what it means. Now, the repetition here that you notice, he says it first, the Chaldeans assume this is just some formal request, then they respond in formality, well, tell us the dream, O king, and then we'll tell you the interpretation. He says, no, you tell me what it was and then what it means. They come back again, assuming they've misheard, well, please just tell us the dream and then we'll apply the interpretation. He comes back again and says, no, it's firm. And as a matter of fact, the stakes just got raised. If you don't tell me the dream, you are dead. I will tear you, it says, limb from limb, so this now becomes a life or death situation. Tell me the dream. But it's a good test, isn't it? Nebuchadnezzar's right. What's one certain way he can prove that they have the ability to interpret the dream? Well, if they can even say to the king what he dreamed in his bed, well, then they prove to have supernatural insight. Well, the Chaldeans and interpreters and the enchanters are understandably distraught. There is not a man on earth, they say, 
who can meet the king's demand. Such an interpretation, interesting insight, belongs to the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. The point is, you're asking for something divine. We can't coerce the gods to tell us what was in your mind on your bed. This is unreasonable. This is ridiculous, Nebuchadnezzar. No great king has ever asked such a thing. You're in good company to just tell us your dream and let us say the interpretation. Troubling dreams. It's just really the prelude to what God's going to do in this chapter, but it, it strikes me how true this is of a non-supernatural, non-Christian world. It's troubling. It's troubling to think about the future and not know. And underlying predictions and expectations and a sense of here's the way the world always works, we always have this sense of, yeah, but you don't know. I remember one time when I moved to a new city and we were going to buy a house for the first time and we're looking at buying a house and, and it was just a ridiculous, insane market. And people were buying houses unseen and this is the first time I ever bought a house. And I thought, is this how people do this? I mean, you don't even see it. You just, just, yes, yes, we like it, you know. But this is crazy. I'm not built for this kind of pressure. I mean, this is, I can't even sleep on it or pray over it. I mean, it seems irreligious to do this this way. We'd like you to sign away your life and never see this house. I thought, this is crazy. And underlying all that was, I don't know. How could you know? And then it proved that all the people, including myself, who did buy houses were wrong after all because the market plunged after that whole time. You don't know. You don't know. The thought was, if I don't buy, I won't be able to buy. Actually, what turned out, if I hadn't bought, I could have bought a lot more. You don't know. Nebuchadnezzar is troubled because he doesn't know. And that trouble turns to anger. That happens in our world all the time. What do you mean you can't tell me what's going to happen? And that trouble results in trouble for other people. If you ever had a boss who demands the impossible, you can relate to these magicians. <laughs> what? We, we're not God. I, I, what are you asking? I, I can't be God right now. But the world wants God-like certainty, and it can't have it. So it gets angry. It gets angry at people. It blames them for what only God can provide. This happens with Christians. We certainly start acting like Nebuchadnezzar. What, what do you mean there's traffic today? I didn't know there was going to be traffic on this road. Oh, is that all it was? All of you ridiculous people looking at the side of the road where there's a dead animal? That caused all this traffic? What's wrong with you people? We can't know. And so we're angry troubled, just like Nebuchadnezzar. The dream, the lack of divine wisdom leads to anger and hopelessness for those that do not know the source of it. If you find yourself angry and hopeless, it may be that you're wanting to know what humans cannot know on their own. The dream. Second section, the deliverance. The deliverance. We see in verse 13 that Daniel is just going to be included in this annihilation of all the wise men. Nebuchadnezzar has decided that these, this guild of wise interpreters is basically all charlatans, and he's going to wipe them out in his anger at their inability to display supernatural knowledge. And so they seek out Daniel as well. So Daniel, after all that's happened, he's been brought into exile. And apparently, as we read the passage, he doesn't even know about what's going on. You can imagine Daniel's experience. He's been taken out of his city, this young man. He's been brought in. He's seen some level of the favor of God already, and he's, he's there in his house. And all of a sudden, here comes a knock at the door. Um, pardon me, you've been scheduled for execution. Why? What just happened? Well, we read Daniel's response beginning in verse 14. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent 
Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went in to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. And the king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. The deliverance. The deliverance. We can feel the drama of the story writing of this passage. And I mentioned last week, I want to state it again, it's so important when we read narrative sections like this that we not assume uh, they're written in the same way a letter would be written or a proverb would be written. We need to, to get into the story in order to feel the impact. We need to feel what Daniel felt. Here comes the captain of the king's guard to his door. You are scheduled for execution. Why? Well, because the wise men couldn't tell the king what he dreamed. I mean, feel the hopelessness and the sense of chaos and the sense of the cynicism would come. Of course that's going to happen. After everything, I've been dragged out of my homeland, and now I didn't even do anything. And because they can't tell come some crazy king what he dreamed last night, I'm going to be executed. But notice, we don't see any of that kind of reaction from Daniel. One of the things that this passage brings out is the peaceful wisdom that comes in a person whose eyes are fixed on the sovereign wisdom of God. The contrast between Daniel and the king and his advisors is stark. We have the king troubled. We have the advisors desperate and defiant. We have Daniel calm and prudent. The difference is stark. Why is that? Well, because Daniel knows there is a God who knows everything. That's the difference. He knows there is a God who can provide the answer to mysteries. I know that God. Now, I don't know for sure whether he's going to tell me the mystery right now, but I know that he knows it. It is knowable, and I know that God who knows it, and I am able to seek him. There is an answer to this, and even if he doesn't tell me, I can be calm and peaceful because I know it's in his hands, as opposed to the magicians who think, this. there's nothing about this that makes any reasonable sense. Daniel says, Well, God knows it all. Let's see what God wants to do, Daniel says. Anger, despair, chaos, trouble, it comes to the heart who does not know the God who knows it all. Peace, prudence, wisdom is found in the heart even in reaction to unexpected and shocking news because he knows the God who knows it all. It's a good thing to ask yourself in terms of your meditations, how do I react, react when shocking, unexpected, difficult news comes upon me? 
That can be a revelation for where your heart has been meditating. Has it been meditating on what man can know or what God knows? This story just builds a case. Look, fix your heart on what God knows, on the fact that God is able to reveal mysteries, that God knows everything, that God knows even the secrets in the heart of a king as he lays on his bed. That's the point of this story. It's important also to point out that, that the Bible is comprehensively supernatural. I, I know there's people that sort of argue against some supernatural elements in the Bible. Well, I, I'm, I'm really troubled by, they'll pick something, the flood. Because, I, man, if I think about the flood, it just seems really unreasonable that a flood could cover all of the earth. Or I'm, I'm really troubled by what the Bible says about, uh, you know, Gideon and, and other soldiers and, and what took place. And there couldn't have been, that, that, would, that doesn't make sense that they could have done that. Or the miracles trouble me. Could a person really rise from the dead? And it's important to point out, look, you can't just pick one supernatural element and be troubled by that. If you're going to be troubled by supernatural elements, you, you have to throw away the whole Bible. There is no Bible left if there's not the supernatural assumption that God is God and he doesn't play by natural rules and he's able to interrupt and disrupt and do the opposite of what nature normally does. He's able to do that. So if, if we trouble with one aspect, let me make the trouble a lot bigger. God is absolutely supernatural from beginning to end. If you don't have a supernatural God, you don't have Christianity. You don't have a Bible. There is no Bible apart from a God who can do the impossible things. So this is just another story where we, where we have to come to terms with that. God is able to do what man cannot do and cannot imagine. He's able to do that. And so we believe that as the church. And we have to keep reminding ourselves of that. I, I, I like saying to people, they, they talk to me about, man, it's so difficult to explain how we hold to certain positions that are culturally offensive. And I've said, look, maybe one thing you can say is, I'm, we are so much crazier than you think we are. I mean, it's not just that I believe in these certain currently offensive cultural positions. I believe stuff that is insane by this world's definition. I believe God created the world, matter, atoms. He counts the stars. He knows the secrets of a king while he's dreaming on his bed. I actually believe that. It's not just a story. This isn't like Jack and the giant beanstalk. No, I, I believe that actually happened. There was a real king. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. He ruled over the, an empire. All the, He had a dream one night, and God knew what the dream was. Was. I, I believe that happened. And he didn't just believe it. He told Daniel what the king actually dreamed. Think about the faith that Daniel had to exercise in the wisdom of God to even say, just give me a moment. Let me go seek my God and I'll come back. <laughs> what, what a thing to say. What a thing to say. Just po a point of time. Give me an hour. Give me an appointment. I'll be there with the dream and its interpretation. There's just this confidence God knows, and he delivers Daniel by telling Daniel what the dream is. Notice Daniel's response to this situation. He prays, and then he praises. He prays. He seeks God. God, you know. It, it implies a trust in God, a confidence. God, you're able to tell me what the king dreamed. And then upon receiving the answer, he praises God. And that speaks to a rhythm of the Christian life as well. We seek God, Lord, I don't, you know the answer to this, and I need you. And when we experience the peace that comes when he does answer, when he reveals truth in some way, then we praise God. And we're not going to experience probably like Daniel did, but the same pattern of life should be true of us. We pray, God, have mercy on me. H have mercy on me in this situation. You know everything that's going on. And then when we experience his mercy in some way, we say, God, it's to your glory and praise. You receive the glory. That happened with, with my daughter when, when she had that, that sickness. It was a number of days in the hospital. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Just bad. I don't know. And then finally one guy came in and said, I, you know, I, I think it might possibly be this. Did a test? Sure enough, there's a solution. We can get her on it right now. She'd seen how many doctors? Why was it the case that she happened to see the doctor that happened to know and that he happened to think of this particular condition? Why? I might think that's a coincidence. But I don't think so. God knows. Did God owe it to me to show what was happening? Of course not. God's God. 
He doesn't owe me anything, but he did. And so prayer leads to praise. God delivered Daniel. There's also kind of a, a lived out parable in this passage. I mean, Daniel, literally, his neck is on the line if God doesn't know everything. I mean, literally, just the fact that God can reveal everything is the salvation that Daniel needs to be literally delivered from death. But you can imagine an Israelite reading this and thinking, you know, in a, in a broader historical way, that's true for all of God's people. All of God's people face death and destruction from a chaotic world if God doesn't actually know what's going on all the time. So you can imagine an Israelite reading this from Daniel and thinking, you know, that's like us also. We also are subject to the whims of erratic rulers and the, the whims of magicians that can and can't do different things. And we're in this exile. We don't know what's going to happen. It's also true of us that if God doesn't know everything and have mercy on us, well, then we also are under a kind of execution. And so they see in Daniel a, a kind of a model, an example of what's always true for God's people. The wisdom of God's perfect sovereignty always provides hope for the deliverance of his people. That's always the case. It was the case for Daniel. It is the case for us. The deliverance points people to a God that knows and controls all of history. You notice that's what Daniel says. You, God, you, you change times and seasons. You remove kings and you set up kings. You give wisdom to those who have wisdom. You gave it to them. You reveal deep and hidden things. You have given me this wisdom. Daniel's saying, look, Lord, you know it all. It's to your glory. You know everything. There is no mystery to you. He even says darkness, darkness. You know what's inside darkness. What a perfect metaphor. God looks at darkness and he sees right through it. There's no darkness to God, no confusion to God. God's never surprised by anything. He's never confused by anything. He looks at darkness. It says light dwells with God. So light, the, the idea of seeing something, it doesn't have an independent existence. It's with God. God sees things by the nature of his existence, of being God. He sees right through darkness. God never met a mystery. He never met a puzzle. He never met confusion. He has no idea what it's like to be confused experientially because he's never been confused. He knows exactly what will happen, what has happened. And that gives hope to his people. To deliverance. Thirdly, the revelation. The revelation. Daniel comes to the king and describes his dream. Imagine Nebuchadnezzar in this moment. Oh, I mean, we get to the end of the chapter, we realize the effect it has on him. But imagine, you dreamed a dream, and here you are on your bed, and you're saying, the only way I can know for sure, if you know this interpretation, if you can literally tell me what I dreamed. Imagine if your spouse said that to you in the morning. I mean, I know that some spouses expect, tell me what I'm thinking, but this really pushes it, <laughs> this pushes it to a different level. Tell me what I dreamed. What did I dream last night? <laughs> I don't know, dear, what you dreamed. <laughs> this is what he says, and here comes Daniel boldly before the king, and you notice these words from the beginning, verse 31, let's read it. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image this image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone, the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. <laughs> what an understatement. <laughs> this was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. I love there's no interruption. Everybody's just silence, stuns, you know. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven 
has given the kingdom the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth, and there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. What a moment. Never a moment like this in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Never. They'd had people that come in and examined livers and said, I believe that your dream of a cow with two heads means they'd had that moment. Never a moment where a person said, here's what you dreamed. And what a dream if this is just a guess. I mean, how wrong could you be on this guess? Way wrong. Here's what you dreamed. There was a figure, gold, bronze, silver, then bronze, then iron, clay, and then there was a rock. I mean, very specific. No way he could kind of get it right. This is either going to be all wrong or all right. What a revelation. What a revelation. God reveals both that he knows even the secrets of the king's dream, and then he reveals, here's what that dream means. Here's what it means. Let me tell you what it means. This was a dream from me, Nebuchadnezzar. You were right to be troubled because it reveals something you should know and you need to know this. Now, trust me, a host of things has been written in terms of interpreting exactly what the kingdoms are that he's referring to. So this is pictorial imagery, very similar to apocalyptic literature like Revelation, where an image is used to represent something. Okay, and lots of pages have been written. Okay, what exactly, which kingdom exactly is being described? Because you have the gold. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the gold, right? So that's your kingdom. And it says silver. There's going to be a bronze kingdom. Then this iron mixed with clay kingdom, apparently four kingdoms. I don't think the main point of this passage is which kingdoms are which. So if you're looking for me to say definitively, I know. If God... (laughs) that can tell Nebuchadnezzar his dream, wanted to say explicitly, I know, here's exactly what the king, he was able to do that. For Daniel, for whom these kingdoms would be in the future, the main point was not what exactly will these kingdoms be named. The main point was God knows every kingdom that's coming and he knows the final end of them all. That's the main point that Daniel and the readers would God knows. God knows every kingdom that's coming, and he knows the name of them all. He knows how long they'll last. He knows who will succeed them, and he knows their final end. Now, if you would like, I I would say, given that we're looking back 2,600 years on this passage, it seems probable to me, if you look at history, that the four kingdoms sure line up awful close with the Babylonian kingdom, which was followed by the Medo-Persian kingdom, which was followed by the Grecian kingdom, which was followed by the Roman kingdom, during which time the stone was established. I I would say likely those are the four kingdoms he's talking about. I mean, just you look at history, it just lines up perfectly. But I don't think that's the main point. I don't think that's the main point. I think the point is Nebuchadnezzar, God knows the beginning of your reign, the end of your reign. He knows who will come next. 
He knows who will come next. He knows who will come next. And all of this is leading to a moment when there will be a kingdom after which nothing will come. There'll be a stone, it says. It will be cut out of the mountain, but not with human hands. And then he explains, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven, verse 44, will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Rather than getting distracted by exactly which kingdom is which, I think the point is the contrast. All of these kingdoms finally are destroyed. And not only just destroyed, despite their apparent strength and glory, in the end, they turn into something like chaff, it says in verse 35, of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carries them away so that not a trace of them is found. But the kingdom that God sets up shall never be destroyed. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms, and it will be as though they were never there in the first place. The point of the passage is the contrast. These temporary kingdoms that appear so strong, that appear mighty, that appear great and just succeed one after another after another are contrasted with a stone that God himself creates that eventually grows to be like a mountain that can never be destroyed and breaks in pieces all others and lasts forever while they fade like chaff that no one notices anymore. What's the revelation? There is a kingdom coming. It's not going to come immediately, Daniel. There's going to be a lot of earthly kingdoms. They're going to progress and progress and progress. It's not going to come in a way that, that, that a human sets it up. It's going to be with God's going to do it. It's going to be cut out of a mountain, not with a human hand. This isn't going to be a, an earthly kind of kingdom. This is a different kind of kingdom. It's going to be like a stone, and, and ultimately this stone is going to, to knock into pieces all of these earthly kings and all their glory and might and apparent strength. Eventually, it's, it's going to be wiped away. It's going to float away on the breeze, and it's going to grow. It's not going to start out to appear as big as it eventually will appear. It's going to start out seeming like a stone, but in the end, it's going to be a mountain. Now, for Daniel... This is intending to bring both a sense of endurance and a sense of ultimate hope. Look, Daniel, it's, it's, it's not coming in the next five minutes. There, there's a lot of empires and kingdoms, and God's people are going to have to endure all of those empires and kingdoms. But take heart. God knows every one of their names. He knows the beginning and end of all of their kingdoms. He knows every moment. God is not surprised by some new empire that rises. He's not surprised when Nebuchadnezzar falls. He knows exactly, and he's charted out exactly what's going to take place. Don't lose heart as you endure through kingdom and empire rising and falling, king rising and falling, ruler rising and falling. Don't, don't lose heart, Daniel. Don't lose heart. God knows every one of them, the beginning and end, and, and there is a great thing coming that will be a comfort to your soul, the kingdom of God. What's the end of all these kingdoms? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is coming. When you look in the New Testament, I read one commentator that made a great point this week. He said, Jesus references to the kingdom of God is among you perhaps more than any other passages in the Old Testament, was referencing Daniel when he uses the phrase, the kingdom of God is among you. I wonder why, why did Jesus use that phrase? It's not like it's pervasive in the Old Testament. There's a few places you could reference it, and this is one of them. The kingdom of God is among you. What is he hoping that God's people remember? Oh, wait, wait a minute. I, I've read Daniel. The kingdom of God is like a stone cut out with no human hand. It has no apparent human creation, but then eventually it's become a mountain. And all of these earthly rulers and, and powerful rulers, they're eventually going to be broken to pieces by it. It will eventually will fill the whole earth. The kingdom of God will grow and grow and consume and ultimately be the only final lasting kingdom there is. What's he saying to Daniel? What's he saying to us? He's saying there is, a, there is a stone that's coming. And every kingdom before and during the coming of that stone will, will rise and fall according to the sovereign wisdom of God. But that stone will fill the whole earth. 
When you get to the New Testament and you read Jesus saying the kingdom of God is among you and that I am the stone that the builders rejected, which has become the capstone, and if anyone falls on it, they will be destroyed, and if it falls on anyone, they will be broken to pieces. You can't help but think Jesus is referring to a number of places in the Old Testament when God himself is referred to as a stone that is the ultimate rock of refuge and destruction for those who don't trust God. Who is Jesus? He is the rock of our salvation. He is the kingdom of God come in the flesh and provided and given to all those who trust in him. This is the kingdom made without hands that lasts forever. It all leads ultimately to him. Finally, what's the response? What's the response? It says in verse 46, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a reveal of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. What's, what's the result of God just giving a glimpse of his wisdom and might to Nebuchadnezzar? The, the literary reversal in this passage is significant. Daniel, under the executioner's knife, literally, becomes Daniel exalted and his God praised while Nebuchadnezzar is on the floor. The, the literary contrast is, is stark and it's intentional. Nebuchadnezzar at the height of power becomes Nebuchadnezzar with his face on the floor. The Daniel companions who are under execution are then elevated above all the wise men and, and even in their, in their service provide safety for those wise men. They're, they're even helping others in this nation. The exaltation of God and the honoring of his people is the final conclusion of God revealing his wisdom and his power. Now, we know that these kinds of moments come and they go in history. They come and they go. Literally, in the very next chapter, it goes. They come and they go. For Daniel, the exaltation comes and it goes. But what we have when it comes like this, and there's this exaltation of God from a pagan king declaring, your God is the God of gods. We, I don't think Nebuchadnezzar saw it fully yet. You actually can read the first half of Daniel as God and Nebuchadnezzar, almost as much as God and Daniel. What's God doing with Nebuchadnezzar is a kind of a subplot of what's happening in the first half of this book. So he hasn't got it all yet. But in this moment, he sees a glimpse that there is a God of gods. So it comes and it goes. What we see in parts of Scripture where it's as though for a moment heaven comes to earth. For a moment, it's turned right side up. And God is exalted, and the kings of the earth bow down, and God's people are elevated, and their enemies are put in the dust. In a moment, it's reversed. It's not permanent. It doesn't last forever, but it gives us a glimpse of what God's wisdom and power will finally bring about. God just gives us a glimpse, and then the, the mystery goes back in again. It has to wait for later. But in the end, this will be the ultimate result when God's perfect wisdom is displayed, because in the end, he's going to display it in a way where it's never concealed again. He's going to reveal it in a way where it's never taken back in under the, under the veil, as it were, of time again. The, the mystery, the ultimate mystery of this passage is this idea that there's going to be a rock. It's going to fill the earth. You won't have seen it coming. It'll be like a rock taken out of a mountain with no human hand that somehow, ironically and unnaturally, grows into a mountain. And in the same way, that's going to happen in history. And when that finally culminates, it's going to be a revelation of God's wisdom and power that can't be concealed 
It can't be hidden again. It will just last forever. And this same result will be the case because the New Testament says, in the end, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Nebuchadnezzar and every human ruler in all of history will be forced to bow down and say, there is a God of gods, there is a King of kings, there is a stone that fills creation, and his name is Jesus Christ, and his kingdom will never be broken, and every human king will be like chaff that the wind blows away, but this one who revealed himself on the cross to save sinners and to rescue them that no human ingenuity could have imagined, God has revealed his mystery that the crucified one is the final king. The king that can never be destroyed is the king that died on the cross. The king that rose from the grave is the mountain that will fill the whole earth and his people will never fade and will be elevated and exalted from all of their brokenness and history and all of their persecution. They will be lifted up and their names are written in the Lamb's book of life and that mountain will be exalted forever. That is the intention of this book. And you can imagine Daniel's heart welling up I don't know when it's going to be, but someday, someday this little moment that we had right now with Nebuchadnezzar that's going to fade tomorrow, it's not going to fade. What a day that'll be. God says, Daniel, let me just give you a just one day, it's all going to flip. People like Nebuchadnezzar, they're going to be on their knees and they're going to have to say, there is a God of gods. There is a king of kings, and his name is Jesus. And no human wisdom could have imagined him, but God had a mystery that he revealed. So yeah, Daniel, you're going to have to endure. And God's people, you're going to have to endure. There's going to be kingdoms. They're going to rise and fall. And ultimately, that's why I think it's, it's not overly helpful to try to ask what exactly the kingdom is because the same is true today. Kingdoms are going to rise and they're going to fall. The, the point is the same. In the end, God's kingdom will rule over all and God's king will be exalted and every tongue will say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we stand in awe of you. Lord, your word says that the, the truth of the gospel is a, a wisdom that cannot be known by human ingenuity, by human intelligence. It cannot be known. And so, Lord, we, we take that to mean that apart from your spirit, we could not know the truth that you are the King of Kings. We could not see in you on the cross the, the glory of God's plan. We couldn't see it, Lord. It would be as veiled to us as the dream was to that king. But Lord, like Daniel, you have revealed to us this great and glorious revelation that you are the king. And we see it, Lord, by faith. And by grace, we see it, Lord. We see the truth of it. And somehow in our souls, we, we know it to be true. That you are the king. That you will reign forever and ever. And we behold you now by faith and one day by sight. So we pray, Lord, when we face unexpected moments where we don't know. I pray, Lord, you would answer to us that there is one thing we do know. You know it all. And you have told us that one day you will rule over it all. And we will be with you. We receive that truth, Lord. We respond to it in the name of Jesus. Amen. But what I'd like to do just for a minute in response before we close is just quietly in our seats... 
that we would choose a few things that we don't know that regularly cause us anxiety. Uh, we all have them. <laughs> things we don't know. Uh, could be a job thing, could be a relational thing, could be a health thing. Sometimes I'll randomly wonder if my car's gonna break down, you know. There's just things we don't know and they can trouble us. Let's take a moment and just cast those I don't know kind of troubles before the Lord and replace them with, here's what we do know. God knows it all. And in the end, his kingdom will rule over all. Let's just do that exchange in a moment before the Lord. Let's just take a minute to do that. have a burden to pray for those whose the, the thing they most don't know that they worry about is their children and I, I just pray Lord that you would comfort them right now Lord whatever this is the mystery that most burdens them Lord I, I just pray that you would comfort them I pray you'd strengthen them Lord reassure them you know it all the future is not dark to you for every child represented. Lord, we pray for your deliverance of them. We pray that you would save their souls. We pray, Lord, any that are facing physical difficulties, we pray you would heal them. Lord, those that are facing temptation, that you would turn them from the evil one. Lord, and we entrust our children into your care, into your hand. Bless those parents, Lord, with comfort. Lord, we entrust the unknown to you, and we thank you for what we do know. We glory in it, in Jesus' name. Amen.